Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Javad Yahami. The de facto authorities in Afghanistan, the Afghan Taliban, had been ruling the war damaged country from last three years, since 15th of August 2021. And now their army chief has made a claim that the promise that they made to the international community that no country would be attacked from Afghanistan, they are sticking to it. We'll be taking the analysis. What is the truth or any sort of a weight associated with this particular claim? The de facto authorities, army chief, has also at the same time denied the presence of Ban Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, Fitna Al Khawarij in Afghanistan also saying that Pakistan has not yet provided any sort of evidence regarding the presence of banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan in Afghanistan and perpetrating the heinous terrorist, uh, terrorist attacks using the Afghan soil. Interestingly and surprisingly, there have been a number of occasions that Pakistani authorities with irrefutable evidence had been uh, telling the Afghan authorities that how, when and where from the banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, the Fitna Al Khawarij had been perpetrating heinous terrorist attacks inside Pakistan using Afghan soil. Not only this, there are also multiple United Nations reports which point to this particular fact. The kind of uh, presence banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan has got in Afghanistan being the largest terrorist group operating from the Afghan soil and also the kind of facilities, kind of support it is enjoying, especially from other militant outfits, the terrorist groups, also the kind of support it is getting from the de facto authorities, the Afghan Taliban. Also in a major development, we have seen Pakistan's Interior Minister, Mr. Mohsin Nakwi, has uh, informed the UN Special Representative for Afghanistan about the presence of banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, Fitna Al Khawarij, in Afghanistan, how they are perpetrating heinous terrorist attacks here in Pakistan using the Afghan soil. And he has also urged the United Nations to help stop this particular activity that is being done by banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan using the Afghan soil. We also know for a fact that today, Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif visited Quetta and he has also uh, vowed to eradicate terrorism from the country he will be taking the analysis regarding as to these particular statements which have come forth by the army chief of the de facto authorities in Afghanistan and uh, the kind of the facts which relate to the presence of different uh, militant outfits and terrorist outfits operating from Afghanistan. For that, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Khalid Tamur Akram, expert in international relations. Mr. Akram, thank you very much for your time for being with us on the show tonight. We really appreciate that. On Skype, at the same time, we are honored to have been joined by Mr. Zahir Shah Shira Shirazi, Afghan affairs expert. Mr. Shirazi, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight. We really appreciate that. Mr. Uh, Akram, if you allow me, let me begin with the discussion with Mr. Shirazi. Mr. Shirazi, by looking at this particular claim which has been made by the army chief of the de facto authorities in Afghanistan, that they are sticking to the promise that they made to the international community, that Afghan soil won't be allowed to be used against any other country or no country would be attacked from Afghanistan. How much weight or truth do you think is associated with this particular claim? Because there are multiple reports, multiple incidents happening that speak otherwise. Mr. Shirazi, uh, I seek your pardon for the interjection over here. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. If you can kindly unmute yourself. I, I think couldn't hear you properly, Javad. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, we can. Please go ahead. Should I repeat the yeah. question for you, sir? Uh, what the Afghan uh, authorities are saying, perhaps it can be a political statement, but I doubt that if there is any reality in that. Uh, we have concrete evidence, and uh, uh, perhaps it's now an open secret that how the TTP, the ISK, Al Qaeda, and even the BLA is operating from Afghan soil and creating light order problem for uh, the Pakistani authorities on, uh, on this side of the border. The UN report is very much uh, you know, visible that the TTP operating from Afghanistan, uh, it is the largest threat in the region to the Pakistani interest as well as 
uh, uh, they, they are posing serious threat uh, after forming a nexus with uh, Al Qaeda and uh, uh, other militant organizations which are operating from Afghan soil. Now, the ISK, uh, perhaps there are reports, and even the, the American think tanks have admitted, and they, they are claiming that the ISK was uh, properly airlifted and brought in here on the Pak Afghan bordering area, where the Taliban might not have uh, an access or they, they, they would not be able to counter them. The reason, obviously, again, this uh, uh, a new great game has uh, started in this region. The Americans would never, like they have left the region, but now they would again be fighting and, you know, overall overlooking this region through the proxies in the form of ISK, even support to the TTP. Now, it's no denial that earlier the TTP was uh, indirectly and crudely uh, being supported through Indian influence as well as the sympathizers and those anti-Pakistan uh, uh, stakeholders which were operating in Afghanistan even during uh, Ghani and Karzai's uh, regime. But now, importantly, the nexus which they have now formed with the BLA, BNA, the ETIM, I think this is proving very serious. Now, the, 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 the recent claim by the BLA for taking out these organized attacks in Balochistan, perhaps it, it doesn't mean that uh, a separatist organization which is like taunting just like uh, uh, AK-47 uh, uh, in their hand and then uh, obviously launching such attacks. But there are uh, different handlers which are supporting these organizations with the latest gadget, with the uh, latest weapon uh, uh, and such organized form of attacks which were launched uh, during the recent two, three days in Balochistan. So obviously the claim by uh, the Afghan authorities, I don't think so. There is any truth in that. It's just a face saving. Uh, obviously, the world knows that uh, 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 whatever things are going on inside the Pakistani border in the tribal areas in Balochistan, it has deep rooted links with the, the militants operating from across the border. So, uh, I think Pakistan has repeatedly conveyed this uh, concern to the Afghan authorities, uh, and it's such a concrete now fact, and there is no denial that Pakistan has the largest threat which is coming and emanating from uh, Afghan soil. Uh, right, Mr. Akram, what is the intention, do you think, is behind this particular claim uh, by the de facto authorities, Army Chief, that they are sticking to the promise they made to the international community and also saying that Ban Tariqa Taliban Pakistan is not present in Afghanistan and Pakistan shouldn't be blaming the Afghan de facto authorities for its weaknesses. <laughs> While it's not only Pakistani authorities which have been giving them irrefutable evidence, there are multiple United Nations reports which point to the fact and it gives the exact number of the strength of the uh, Fitna al-Khawarij militants present there. Uh, yes, we have seen that uh, ever since the uh, Tariqa Taliban uh, Afghanistan, they have come in power in uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, they have been making several promises with Pakistan initially also and then later on also that their soil will not be used against uh, uh, against Pakistan. But we have seen a uh, number of attacks happening in Pakistan and interestingly all these attacks happening in Pakistan uh, by these terrorists uh, have the uh, that uh, weapons uh, which were left behind by NATO. Uh, they were uh, uh, all the NATO grade weapons and the US weapons which are being used. Uh, uh, I, unfortunately, I must say this thing uh, that uh, the Afghan government, the present Afghan government has not been able to even take a stock of those weapons uh, which were left behind for uh, their military. And uh, they uh, they are now in the hands of uh, these terrorists. And secondly, uh, we observe that uh, uh, although they are uh, making this claim, but look at the history of last three years. Um, uh, uh, we have a very long border with uh, Afghanistan. Initially, we saw that uh, 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 these terrorists, they have been cutting the wire along the border. There are lots of videos on the social media. And then uh, the uh, Afghan government used to say that uh, the warlords on the uh, border areas are not in their control. So practically speaking, the Afghan government is only restricted to Kabul and Kandahar. Uh, outside uh, uh, these two cities, they do not have that kind of control which a national government should have. And also, uh, uh, we have been seeing lots of infiltration, uh, lots of attacks, uh, direct attacks from the Afghan territory uh, on our security forces. So uh, they do not have any kind of replies to these things. 
and uh, they, uh, Pakistan government have been repeatedly sending delegations over there and uh, uh, we have been handing over the evidences. Recently we have uh, handed them over the evidence uh, that uh, ab about those terrorists who had attacked a Chinese convoy in Dasu. Uh, so all these evidences are not only known uh, to them but also to the international community. So I think that these statements are just mere statements. Uh, uh, the Afghan government has to wake up and they have to uh, control their own territory first and then they should start this blame game or any other thing. So, 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 so to what purpose do you think such type of statements are being released, this pattern of denial continuously on the part of the Afghan Taliban? Yes, one, uh, because they have a similar pattern of denial since last three years. Uh, the reason is this, that uh, they cannot, they do not have the control over complete Afghanistan. As I said, presently the Afghan government is only restricted to uh, the bigger cities. So they don't have control over uh, the border areas, they do not have control over uh, uh, various provinces. Uh, and unfortunately, this uh, uh, terrorist organizations are uh, not only have their headquarters over there, but they are getting training over there, they are being launched from there. The weaponry, uh, I'm, I fail to understand this thing that three years have passed. Up till now, in last three years, the Afghan government has not been able to take a stock of the weapons uh, which were with the Afghan National Army. And let me also uh, tell here that it's a very strange thing that on 15th August 2021, once the Afghan uh, Taliban took power, uh, their complete army ran away. It's, 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 it's a really strange thing. Uh, I, I don't think that this kind of uh, thing has happened uh, anywhere in the history that um, on, in the, on the morning of And 16th. that alludes to the fact that was a very hasty withdrawal. Um, the Afghan National Security Forces, if I exactly remember the number of Afghan National Security Forces at that time, which had been trained for two decades with the international troops, it was 300,000. Yes. And there was not even a tint of resistance when the presidential palace was being taken yeah, over by the Afghan Taliban. But my point is this, that uh, uh, it's the hasty withdrawal was by the NATO. Uh, the Afghan national forces were not withdrawing to Europe. They had to be there. It was their country. They, it was their duty to protect. It was just, uh, for them, it was a change of government happening. But on 16th of August, we saw that all of a sudden, the complete uh, 300,000 uh, strong military, it vanished. And uh, the weapons, they... Uh, the weapons there, all the equipment and everything, uh, uh, it was eventually with the terrorist. Whether it is ISKP, whether it is uh, TTP, whether they, there are other organizations, all of them, they had those weapons. And Pakistan had been giving uh, lots of evidences. Uh, and the initial attacks happened in Banu, I remember, in 2022. Uh, Pakistan, uh, the, our security forces even showed those weapons and those... Uh, 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 bulletproof jackets and all those things which were taken away from Afghanistan. So these are the hard facts. But now the, with these weapons, Mr. Akram, uh, in the hands of the terrorists and Afghan Taliban not taking stock of the, pres uh, the availability of these NATO caliber weapons at the hands of the terrorists, what is the way forward? I'll come back to you uh, for your detailed yes. understanding regarding that. Let me once again proceed towards Mr. Shirazi. Mr. Shirazi, uh, uh, this particular issue of weapons uh, now, what ideally could be done, what could be the way forward in this particular regard with the fact that everybody knows that n those NATO caliber weapons are readily available at the hands of the terrorists which they are using uh, to perpetuate their heinous crimes? Well, Jawad, as uh, Khalid was mentioning, actually, it's dollars of those weapons, and it uh, also includes very heavy weapons for and uh, uh, all those uh, uh, sophisticated jackets and other gadgets used by the U.S. Marines even. And uh, we have seen as the you know, mentioned uh, CTD headquarters in uh, Banu. Uh, as, uh, number of attacks Mr. Shirazi, I seek your pardon for the interjection over here. There is a lot of distortion. Unfortunately, we can't hear you properly. We'll try to reconnect with you to have your view regarding this particular aspect also. Mr. Akram, your take. What's uh, the way forward as I, to addressing think, this particular uh, availability of weapons? I think the way forward is that uh, the regional countries must sit together because we have seen that uh, the Taliban government is not ready to listen to us. Uh, yes. 
uh, they have a very close relationship now with China. They have a very close relationship with Iran. They have a very close relationship with Uzbekistan. Uh, all the regional countries uh, must sit with them and uh, they must mediate because it is not the matter of only Pakistan. It is the matter of the regional security uh, because if Afghanistan is stable, then the trade between uh, uh, Central Asian countries and Pakistan can happen. Then the trade between Iran and uh, Afghanistan can happen. So stability in Afghanistan, uh, uh, counter-terrorism operations in Afghanistan are for the betterment not only for Pakistan but also for the region. Uh, I personally think that uh, the regional stakeholders should come forward, they should sit and uh, we should not, we should not, uh, uh, I am not saying that we should be sending troops on ground to Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is an independent country as Pakistan, we respect their sovereignty, we respect them, they are our brothers but unfortunately uh, right now we feel that they are not taking enough steps and if they are not ready to listen to us then maybe uh, they would be ready to listen to our other friends and uh, we have seen that uh, uh, China and uh, UAE now they have, uh, they have welcomed the uh, Afghan uh, uh, ambassadors, diplomats. Uh, diplomats in their countries. Pakistan also have a working relationship with the, uh, the Afghan government, although uh, uh, US and uh, the United Nations has still not recognized this government as a legitimate government. But all the neighboring countries, they are helping them. We have been sending them aid. We have been, uh, we have been extending a lot of support to them. We have even allowed India to uh, send uh, their trade via Pakistan to them. So Pakistan has been doing a lot for them. In the last three years, uh, we have, uh, um, uh, if you remember, the first OIC conference uh, on Afghanistan uh, was the initiative of Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has been uh, um, going out uh, everywhere to, uh, to plead their case. Um, we have seen uh, even our Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif uh, on many occasions he has been uh, calling upon the international community to help the Afghan brothers and we are really with them because Pakistan and Afghanistan we consider uh, as uh, uh, they, are, they are not only our neighbors but they are our brothers. They, uh, Pakistan has hosted more than 3 million Afghan refugees for a very, very long time and now those refugees have their third generation living in Pakistan. So I feel that uh, uh, it is the duty of the Afghan government that they should not uh, just give mere statements. Uh, they should uh, act upon these things. They should uh, hand over those people to Pakistan. If they can't try them, then they should ju just expel them. They should just uh, uh, keep send them, them there. Uh, don't should. keep them there. They should because they all are wanted people, and Pakistan has been demanding them. So they, if they are not ready to take any action against them, they can push. just push them across the border, tell us that, okay, uh, these are the people who are wanted by you, they are, they are the terrorists and we are sending them back. So Pakistan can uh, arrest them and we can uh, uh, try them in our courts. Uh, right, uh, we are once again uh, connected with Mr. Shirazi. Mr. Shirazi, now these, uh, these NATO caliber weapons, easily, readily available at the hands of the terrorists, uh, being used uh, in heinous uh, terrorist attacks. Is there any way to retrieve those now? Uh, well, I think when uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, 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 leaving uh, Pakistan, actually they didn't plan. And most of these weapons, they just fell into the hands of those warlords, militant groups, even the TTP, uh, the ISK, and uh, a number of other terrorist groups. And uh, one theory is that perhaps uh, uh, this might have been done intentionally. Uh, maybe it's right or wrong, but uh, yes, this is a very serious threat, not only to the Kabul government, but also a very serious threat to Pakistan. As we have seen, most of those attacks which are launched, like after the withdrawal of uh, U.S. troops from Afghanistan, uh, these weapons were used. Uh, a huge cache of uh, these weapons and uh, latest gadget was also recovered on the Park of Van Turkum border when uh, the Afghan truckers were smuggling uh, them to down town in, in Pakistan. So uh, obviously not only uh, these weapons, but the way they are being, uh, you know, smuggled into Pakistan, this is a serious issue. And even uh, you can uh, buy them in the, some of those uh, tribal areas, which, are, which we, we can say are remote and uh, uh, where the law enforcement agencies are not so much active. Again, coming to 
uh, the use of Afghan soil. You have seen like uh, uh, most of the bordering provinces from Kunar, Paktika, Paktia, Khos, almost, almost all of this felt. Uh, even Paktika along the uh, 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 the Park of Afghan border in Kurram Agency, along uh, north and south of uh, we have seen the fallout of those attacks which are being carried out here. The Chatral incident is very much visible. How hundreds of those people, they gathered at the border, even the Pakistani authorities had conveyed that some militant movement is there. But, but despite that, the, uh, uh, the Kabul government did not take any action. Now, different theories are being put. First is that perhaps uh, Kabul is not willing to take action against the TTP, considering them their half-brothers who fought along with them uh, during the uh, Afghan Jihad or uh, the war on terror, uh, which like uh, uh, during during the, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the last, like almost two, three decades. So this is one reason. Then the sympathy which they have with these uh, militant groups, perhaps it's again the negation of uh, the Doha agreement where they have uh, agreed in principle that their soil would not be allowed to be used against any country, especially if more specific to uh, Pakistan, uh, and sorry, Pakistan. But importantly, now the new great game which is going on here, the Americans still wanted to have their presence in the region. Uh, obviously, number one, to, uh, uh, you know. point, Mr. Shirazi, I'll take your view because I have to go for a very quick short break. After this particular break, I'll give you uh, the chance to talk about this particular uh, point that you've just highlighted regarding the new great game. And viewers for that, stay tuned. Welcome back to Views on News. We are discussing the statements given by the de facto authorities in Afghanistan's army chief regarding uh, the denial of the presence of Bantari Ka Taliban Pakistan, Fitna Al Khawarij in Afghanistan. Also, we know for a fact there are multiple uh, UN reports that point to the fact that there is a considerable strength of a Bantari Ka Taliban Pakistan uh, number of heads over there, and they've been using Afghan soil uh, against. Uh, Pakistan also and uh, in the studio we are uh, honored to have been joined by Mr. Uh, Khalid Amur Akram uh, and uh, for now we are also joined by Professor Dr. Muhammad Ziaul Haq. He is Director General Islamic uh, Research Institute International Islamic University. Uh, Dr. Ziaul Haq, thank you very much for your thank time you for being much. with us on the show. On Skype we are at the same time uh, joined by Mr. Zahir Shah Shirazi Afghan affairs expert. Mr. Shirazi, uh, before going on the break you were talking about the new great game. Uh, please go ahead with your thoughts. Uh, well, there was, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, uh, the US had left Afghanistan, but still it wanted to have its foot inside here. And uh, we have seen in the form of uh, uh, different uh, militant groups which are being indirectly or directly patronized. And uh, the close relationship with uh, 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 the U.S. government have with Afghanistan. I think uh, the, the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan is the third largest recipient of the uh, uh, international aid from the United States after Ukraine and Israel. And uh, uh, they're also being uh, like uh, given $600 billion a month for the defense and uh, uh, the law and order and security, which is above and all from uh, that system, which is being uh, uh, sent to Kabul for humanitarian assistance. Now, why the U.S. wanted to have a presence? I think the Chinese are very actively and, uh, you know, uh, predominantly trying to extend the CPAC or the BRI project into the, even Afghanistan, and they have in the negotiation with the Kabul authorities. And they've also handed over a list of more than 200 of those uh, um, ATIM or TIP militants to a Kabul government that if they want development and Chinese investment in Afghanistan, uh, they would have to carry out or expel those Uyghur militants, which are a serious threat to uh, the, the, the Chinese interest. So I think this is, again, a China-US uh, you know, uh, conflict going on in this region. And this is very important, I think, and we have to take it very seriously. Uh, another important aspect of this is we have seen these, these uh, militant uh, groups, which are... kind of responsibility the U.S. has got to play. When we talk about the responsibility and the role of the United States of America, we know for a fact that Pakistan has been the frontline ally in the war on terror. When it comes to um, the support to uh, the international troops at that time. Now, uh, in the recent past, we have also seen a number of times uh, the high-ranking officials from the United States of America expressing support 
for Pakistan against this menace of terrorism and also unequivocal, unequivocal and unconditional support against the Ban Tariqa Taliban Pakistan. So Pakistan being the frontline ally for the last two decades with the United States of America, what ideally should Pakistan be expecting when it comes to their promises, uh, the expression of their support in dealing with this banned uh, Tariqa Taliban Pakistan? Well, Nawaz, you have seen when the U.S. troops were here, they were very much active. They have, uh, you know, a huge presence. The TTP was very much there. They were active there. Yes, we can say that the drone attacks, most of the top uh, TTP leadership was eliminated by the U.S. drone attacks and even like uh, the, the COVID operation which was carried out on the bordering areas. But still, I don't think so that the U.S. had been very seriously pursuing that TTP. And there is one theory that perhaps as Pakistan was uh, accused by the United States that we are supporting, uh, the Pakistani uh, establishment is supporting the Haqqani network, there was also a similar allegation that the CIA or the United States for, for the sake of it is supporting TTP. So I think uh, perhaps the, the counter the allegations and counter allegations were there. But a serious issue is that for the third time, the U.S. left uh, Afghanistan and they dished Pakistan again. Perhaps they had been accusing Pakistan of uh, doing a double game, but the U.S. played a triple game with Pakistan. You know, again, all those weapons, all those uh, leftover uh, uh, you know, more than $10.3 billion of uh, uh, war equipment and gadgets, they are still being used against the Pakistan in the Pakistani state. So this is one thing. But I would say... Let, let me take this point. The, uh, the uh, ready and the availability of this particular uh, factor, these NATO caliber weapons at the hands of the banned TTP in particular. Dr. Ziaul Haq, is there any sort of mechanism once we know for a fact that they have gone into the hands of the terrorists which have been uh, used against Pakistan in particular? Is there any sort of a way to retrieve them? And what could be expected from the Afghan authorities regarding that? I think in our policy, we should not expect anything from the Afghan authorities. Uh, Afghan authorities will not uh, help Pakistan. And I feel that that is a place uh, available for uh, you know, facilitation on rent. So they have been rented against Pakistan and they will never help Pakistan. So we should have to focus on our own strategies and there can be, first of all, in my opinion, we should have clear cut direction. Directionless policies will not work at all. If we have clear cut direction and we have clear cut mission that we have to clean our land from the terrorist, then Pakistani army has previously cleaned and Pakistani army is still capable to clean it again. And as the Pakistani authorities have also already decided to launch the vision Azme Istehkam in that particular regard. Also. I think we, so. we, we are a sovereign state, so we have every right to clean our land from such type of terrorist groups. And we should not stop at all because legitimate physical com compulsion is a right of a sovereign nation state. And this is a right of Pakistan. Pakistan must execute this right with full strength and neither the terrorists nor their helpers, their facilitators should be tolerated on Pakistani land. This is the first step towards eradication of terrorism from Pakistani land. In second step, we should work against the facilitators and against the ideology of terror. I am sure that Pakistani security forces are capable to eradicate uh, from the terrorists, but the extremist mindset that is created by them, it is a real danger for us. So we need to work in the long run to uh, contest this uh, extremist mindset, because this extremist mindset will continue to facilitate them and facilitate terrorists, either the terrorists coming from Afghanistan or the some other banned terrorist organizations. Because historically, the Khwarij has learned only one language. And that language, our security forces know how to use it. So we have to use that language. That's all. 
So, uh, regarding uh, eliminating or eradicating the extremist mindsets, what could be the yeah, ideal that, that, steps? That is a real challenge. For that purpose, we need to have multi-dimensional strategies. Again, uh, I will suggest here that we need clear direction. No ifs and buts. A very clear direction. And after attaining that very clear direction, and for that clear direction, we have already policy documents, we have security policies, we have Pagame Pakistan National Narrative. So already the work has been done for that purpose. After that we need to work in the whole, uh, we need to pool resources, we, we need to strengths of different institutions, academies, uh, universities, ministries. We should work with the focus that we have to remove. Uh, extremism from our society. Uh, right. You just talked about the educational institutions. Also, you talked of the Pegame Pakistan yes. Fatwa. So, uh, when we talk about the religious seminaries, uh, taking a stock of the National Action Plan, uh, back in 2014, that horrific incident of APS that happened that brought the entire nation to a national consensus of eradicating this menace once for all. The National Action Plan talks about the regulation, the registration of the religious seminaries. Back in 2021, it was revised. Once again, talks about the re registration and regulation of religious seminaries. How crucial and important that is and what is required to do that? Uh, uh, what I would like to suggest, uh, I have in my information that uh, Pakistani authorities are already working with the Madrasa boards. Uh, there is umbrella organization of Madrasa board and Itahat uh, and Zimat al-Madars. And that uh, umbrella organization is also cooperating with Pakistani authorities and they are also helping out. Here again we need to identify which type of institutions are involved in uh, producing of extremism. Extremists are not produced only in madrasas. The suicide girl, she was student of uh, Turbat University. So we have to focus wherever terrorists are, instead of saying that the terrorists are only in relig religious seminaries. It is possible that many of them, they took hostages in, the, in these religious seminaries, but they are not only there, they are um, in many places, including modern universities and educational institutions. And it is clearly stated in Pagam Pakistan, wherever they will be, they will be hunted and they will be forced to either leave Pakistan or they will be eliminated. So we have to take this clear step, clear direction, no mercy, no relaxation. Point well taken. Khwaraj has to be dealt as it is mentioned Receive in the Receive your point well. Uh, let me take this very point to Mr. Akram. Mr. Akram, eradicating or dealing with extremist mindset, your understanding regarding that, what steps are required for that? Yeah, first of all, uh, uh, as the professor is right that it's not only religious uh, madrasas that we have to see, we have to see uh, around us. Uh, we need to revi revise our curriculum, we need to have a strong de-radicalization uh, uh, movement, uh, we need to educate our teachers, uh, we need to train the teachers that what they should be telling it to the, to the students. Uh, we should have a national narrative. Uh, we should uh, uh, be making, uh, it's not only uh, to deal with the terrorism, we have to stop the future youth for going towards this direction. We have to have a, a national narrative, we have to get out of this uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, mindset uh, that who's Balochi, who's Sindhi, who's Pathan, who's Punjabi. Uh, we all are Pakistanis and we need to tell this to our future generation. Uh, uh, th there's a lot of disappointment uh, in the uh, youth and most of this disappointment is spread through the social media. We have Th very through recently disinformation? Uh, through the disinformation. We have, uh, uh, we have seen very recently uh, the army chief uh, has been telling to the students that uh, uh, we need to watch for what we are seeing on the social media. Uh, it's not that uh, anywhere you go in the world, you go in China, you go in Central Asia, you go um, uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, th it's the state's responsibility uh, to train their people, to, uh, to protect their people from uh, this uh, uh, cyber terrorism. Uh, 
uh, I think Pakistan government has taken the right steps and uh, uh, to counter this cyber terrorism because uh, the educated youth is getting influenced from the social media and we need to not only keep a track of that but we need to highlight this in front of Google, in front of all the social media apps and we must tell them that what kind of hatred is being spread in Pakistan. Okay, so uh, one uh, very important point going back to the same statement that has been made by de facto authorities, Army Chief, denying the presence of banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan in Afghanistan. Just a couple of days before, we saw a statement by the spokesman of the de facto authorities, Zabiola Mujahid. He also denied uh, the presence of TTP there, but at the same time, he said that the uh, uh, Afghan authorities ready for the mediation between banned TTP and the Pakistani authorities. You have seen for a fact that Pakistani authorities have been very clear about not having any sort of negotiations with banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan until, unless they completely surrender to the writ of the state. Um, and until that, it has been declared as an absolute red line. So the question is, if they are denying the presence of TTP on the Afghan soil, how can they work as a mediator between TTP and the Pakistani authorities? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. One, as we know that uh, uh, TTP and uh, uh, all the terrorist groups like even BLA, uh, now it has its presence in Afghanistan. All of them are present in Afghanistan. It, is, uh, it cannot be denied. Uh, whatever the Afghan government are giving statements, it's just for the media consumption. It is just for uh, telling the world that uh, they are being very judicious and they are being uh, the, the Afghan soil and not being used. Uh, I think the complete world knows this thing that the Afghan soil is not in their control. Uh, uh, and at the same time, they are offering to mediate. Uh, now, where, why they are offering to mediate is one of the reasons is that that uh, TTA, the Afghan uh, Tariqa Taliban Afghanistan, they think that all these forces, all these negative forces have helped them uh, against, uh, um, uh, against NATO and US forces in Afghanistan. But if they were getting their help, that's their problem. That's not our problem. We never uh, asked them to take their help. We never supported uh, this kind of terrorism. Uh, even in the Hamid Karzai's time, uh, even in Ashraf Ghani's time. So Pakistan's stance in last 20 years has been very, very clear on terrorism. Uh, we are probably the only country in the world which, who has rooted out the terrorism without any foreign help. And uh, uh, so if they were taking their help or if they were they are close to each other, it's not our problem. Our problem right now is this, that Afghan soil is used against Pakistan. Uh, all these people uh, are uh, getting... Uh, in uh, from Afghanistan to Pakistan, they are using uh, those weapons, uh, the uh, NATO grade uh, standard weapons and the American standard weapons. I don't call them NATO weapons, I call them the Afghan National Army weapons because all those weapons were being used by Afghan National Army for the last 20 years. So wasn't there any responsibility on the US while withdrawing to take those weapons back or just leave them at the hands of the Afghan National Security Forces and they couldn't have uh, that capability to you know, control them and let them go in the hands of the well, terrorists? Well, I think uh, the US had handed uh, those weapons to the Afghan National Army. I think US was also not expecting the complete 300,000 army will run away in one night. And probably uh, they had not planned the withdrawal in a way that they would take the weapons back from the Afghan National Army because those weapons were, uh, practically speaking, they were given to Afghan National Army and they were using it. So um, uh, I don't think that US and NATO forces had uh, the plans to take those weapons back. Uh, but uh, uh, now this here comes that who trained that army? That army was trained by the NATO forces. That army was trained by the uh, U.S. forces. Naturally, uh, this is the question uh, as to the kind of training that was imparted. What kind of training that got? This is, this is quite a surprise. And I uh, had been trying to get this answer. And uh, what answer I got was because that army was never trained uh, for, uh, for protecting a country. Uh, they were just given money and they were just uh, uh, like they were twice soldiers. Uh, they were not... Uh, they did not have any kind of motivation level. They did not have any kind of nationalism in them because all of them, they were working like uh, twice soldiers only for money. Apologies. And uh, the moment they saw uh, US going away, NATO going away, everybody ran away. Got your point. Uh, Mr. Shirazi, uh, what's your understanding? How the Afghan Taliban can offer mediation between Pakistani authorities and Fitna al-Khawarij, the banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, if they 
continue to deny the presence of the banned TTP on Afghan soil? Well, Jawad, I think there is uh, no denial to the fact that uh, these uh, TTP penitents, their leadership, is constantly in touch with the, uh, even the media people. We are getting calls from them from Afghan them. They are constantly being in touch. They are sending their messages. And uh, perhaps they are very much active and operational. Even uh, uh, along the pak Afghan border, there are identified areas where the Pakistani uh, 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 you know, uh, forces have struck. And I think if uh, Afghan authorities are not willing to share the intelligence, Pakistan do have a lot of intelligence sharing from that side of the border, from their sources, and they know that where these people are. But now I think perhaps it's time, as uh, Professor Sabah mentioned, that uh, we must have a a direction to carry out, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, action. Now, it's, it's not time that we are again and again asking Kabul to take action against those people who are destabilizing Pakistan. Pakistan should be very much uh, now in an active mode and we should go against them by all force. The second important thing, the uh, uh, radicalization issue. I think the radicalization of this region was carried out under a plan by the Nebraska University. And uh, perhaps it took like more than three to four decades to radicalize and infuse an extremist Islam in the youngsters' mind, in the people who are studying here in the madrasas and the religious schools. But now, after that, when the US-led coalition, you know, dished Pakistan and the Afghan region for almost third time, there was no plan with Pakistan for de-radicalization of that area, which was very serious. And now, how we are going to de-radicalize this region? Obviously, we have to develop this region. We have to, you know, uh, 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 create some opportunities. There, there, there should be economic uh, activity. There should be uh, education activity, uh, facilities to facilitate those youngsters to be away from those extremists. And yes, unfortunately, we're short of time. I'll have to take the closing comments from uh, Dr. Ziaul Haq also. Dr. Ziaul Haq, your closing comments as to this particular relationship. Now, interestingly, the Afghan authorities have also claimed that their relations with all their neighboring countries are normal and good. No, their relations are had never been normal throughout the history. Afghanistan was always on rent for wars. This is the history. Afghan wars were not fought. Afghan wars were bought. So I am afraid to say, but it might be reality, that enemies of Pakistan has purchased Afghanistan to become a center of conspiracy against Pakistan. So is there any role United Nations can play at this particular point in time? I in think order to deal no with that. No one will uh, play any role. We have to rely on our own self. Professor Dr. Mohammad Ziaul Haq, Director General at the Islamic Research Institute at Rashi Islamic University, thank you very much for taking time thank out. You, for views you. on news tonight, really appreciate that. Mr. Khalid Amur Akram, expert in international relations, thank you very much for your time. Also, for being with us on the show, Mr. Zahisha Shirazi, Afghan affairs expert, joining us on Skype, thank you very much for your time. Also, for being with us on the show tonight, really appreciate that. With that, we come to the end of today's episode. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.